Hey guys, Miss Melissa, and we are back with another week of the study of this book by Adam Hamilton called Incarnation. And this particular week, we are talking about um, Jesus being called Emmanuel because we are talking about the titles that Jesus has held and the names that we call him in the study. This particular chapter has a ton of history in it, and so I'm going to be reading a section of this book to you. There's no reason for me to reword Adam Hamilton's version of history um, when I can just read it to you and it would make much more sense. So before we get started with all of that, 2020 has been a year of history, right? Like this particular season of life has been so strange for a lot of people. And we have not lived long enough, myself included, I know you think I'm old, to have this happen before. Like even myself doesn't know what 2020 was about, how it, like, it just kind of hit us. And we're like, oh my gosh, 2020 has been crazy. And that's the word we keep using, 2020 has been crazy. And we just keep looking to 2021 to be better or different. And there's hope in 2021 that it will be different because it's not 2020. And so we just kind of hang on to that. Hopefully we're hanging on to that hope. So we're going to go back to a time when there were other things happening in the world. And this is, you know, the world has seen other things besides 2020 and survived. And you talk to anybody who's been through a lot in their life in the, the higher generations of life, so to speak, they've seen and done a lot. And so they have, they can say, oh, we've survived this and we survived the Great Depression and we can do this too. We can do hard things. So that hope that they carry, that constant reminder is something we need to, to learn as younger generations and I know y'all are younger than me, to get us through what might come again, because who knows what's in our future. So this Emmanuel, or this version of hope, is extremely important, I think. And Adam spends a lot of time talking about the pandemic and how it has affected you personally. And he has some questions, and I would just like to personally ask you. Obviously, I can't get an answer, but just to think on these for a second. Question number one, how did your life change as a result of the pandemic? Number two, what challenges did you face or are you still facing as a result of the pandemic that you hadn't before? Number three, how have you stayed connected to your church community during this time? Have you prayed and have you worshiped? How have you seen God at work in the ways that people in your community or elsewhere have responded? And when many years from now you look back, what do you think you'll remember the most? And if you don't have a journal or if you don't keep any kind of like memories of such, I would encourage you to jot down this particular year. Write down the things that you remember them happening. Make sure that Google helps get those lines, those timelines straight, and then put your opinions and your thoughts into it because you might not remember. And someday down the road, somebody may ask about dear old year 2020 and you'll go, you know what? I have something that might we can look at because it has all my thoughts from that year. And how you overcame certain obstacles and how you forged ahead will be super beneficial maybe to someone else. So think about that, these questions and maybe how you can help somebody else down the line with, with how you've handled things, even as a regular old, you know, 16 year old kid. So we're going to talk about um, what's, what actually was happening in the time of um, Isaiah, because when we talk about the birth of Jesus, Matthew, the book of Matthew specifically talks about Isaiah and references Isaiah and the term Emmanuel. So I would like to note, I did see in my notes before I get too far. I don't believe that God sent the, the pandemic to us. I don't believe the pandemic is God's will. Adam writes on page 90 of his book that he does not believe that God sent the pandemic or that it's God's will. Um, I do believe that God is with us in times of tragedy and in times of uncertainty and especially in times of fear. And that it is our job to make a good of a situation that, that we've been given. But I don't think that unnecessary deaths and, and all the tragedies of life are, are God's will that, that they've been imposed on us. So that's a story for another time. I just wanted to let you know. Okay, so we're going to be talking about um, what Matthew wrote in his particular book on the birth of Jesus. And so I'm going to start right here on page 91 where it says, as Matthew wrote the opening to his gospel, retelling the Christmas story and reflecting on the significance of the birth of Jesus, he offered these words. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that's Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. This is, these are Adam's words. 
This was a remarkable connection Matthew made with the words of Isaiah and an essential insight into the meaning of Christmas and the significance of Jesus. No other New Testament author cited these words of Isaiah. Now, we're going to talk about what Emmanuel means. So he says, let's turn back the clock, 735 years before the birth of Jesus. At this time in history, the kingdom that David and his son Solomon had ruled two centuries earlier had split into two kingdoms. So there's the north and the south, and I'm going to show you a picture. Here's Israel, and it was divided into, you can see by the shading, the north and the south. And here's what was going on. Oh gosh, I can't turn the page. Okay. It says, mm -hmm. nine of the original 12 tribes of Israel broke away and formed what has been known as the Northern Kingdom. These nine tribes retained the name Israel for their kingdom, but they rejected Solomon's son, Rehoboam, as their king. To make matters a bit more confusing, the prophets sometimes referred to the Northern Kingdom as Ephraim after the tribe whose land included the capital of the North, Samaria. To make it even more confusing, at times they also refer to the Northern Kingdom simply as Samaria. So you've got the Northern Kingdom, which is part of Israel, but they're calling themselves Israel. And sometimes they're calling themselves Ephraim, and sometimes they're calling themselves Samaria. To the south, the Southern Kingdom came to be known as Judah, after the largest and most dominant tribe in this region. This kingdom was made up of the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon. Its capital was Jerusalem and its people retained loyal, remained loyal to Solomon's son, David's grandson, Rehoboam. After the northern tribes broke away, Levites served the religious needs of the community in both the northern and the southern kingdoms. Okay, by Isaiah's time, these two kingdoms had been divided for almost 200 years. Despite their differences, the northern and the southern kingdoms still shared history, language, religion, and culture. Sometimes they were allies and military allies that joined against or for another enemy, and other times they fought each other. Now, that brings us to where we are. 735 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel formed an alliance with the kingdom of Aram. Okay, that is what's modern day Syria. Israel and Aram hoped to rebel against the dominant superpower of the day, the Assyrian Empire, freeing themselves from Assyrian control and the payment of heavy taxes. To do this, they needed Judah, the southern kingdom, to help. But King Ahaz of Jerusalem in the southern kingdom refused to join this, this coalition. As a result, the kings of Aram and Israel, this section, sorry, you can't really see that, of the northern kingdom, prepared to attack Judah, the southern kingdom, planning to kill Ahaz and install a favorable king, one who would lead Judah's armies into battle with them. So they wanted to go attack, kill off somebody so they could have somebody that, that would work with them in the southern kingdom. This was terrifying, obviously, to the people of Judah. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 7, chapter 7, verse 2, it says, The heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. It was then that God told Isaiah the prophet to find King Ahaz and say, Take heed, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. That's great, That's great imagery for me. The two smoldering stumps refer to the kings of Israel and Aram from the northern kingdom. Then God promised that the harm the kings sought to do to Ahaz wouldn't happen provided Ahaz would stand firm in his faith. Now let's recap, because that's a lot. Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, Northern Kingdom wanted to go against the Assyrians and they needed Southern Kingdom's help. So they reached out and said, can you help us? And they were like, no, we don't really want to help you. And so they were like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make an attack and we're going to kill off this person to make sure that the next person that they, they vote in will, will help us. And so down here, little Ahaz is like, oh no, we're really worried in the southern kingdom because they want to kill us. And God steps in and says, don't worry, right? Well, I'm sure they're worried, but he's trying to tell them not to. So this is where we get the first sign of Emmanuel. This is Emmanuel with an I. God essentially said to Ahaz, ask me for a sign that what I've promised will happen, that these two kings will be no threat to you. God just says, ask me for a sign. You're worried about it? 
ask me for a sign. But A has refused to ask for a sign. In response, Isaiah tells Ahaz, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child grow, knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in, dread will be deserted. I didn't read that well. Let me read the last line again. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Essentially, before this kid gets to a certain age, they're not going to, you're not going to have to worry about them anymore. So back to what's written. The events that led to this word from Isaiah occurred around 735 or 734 BC. Isaiah's prophecy unfolded just like he said. And we know that because of what's written in Matthew. So I'll skip ahead. In 732, when the child was two or three, the Assyrians attacked both Aram and Israel, the northern kingdom, and forcibly relocated some of their people to Assyria. This may have been the fulfillment of the prophecy, but it seems more likely the prophecy returns refers to Emmanuel around 12 or 13 years old. In the year 722, the Assyrian army marched on the northern kingdom of Israel and destroyed it, taking the rest of the people into exile. And in 720, Aram was destroyed as well, precisely what God told would happen. The child, Emmanuel, whose name meant God is with us, is a living sign of God's promise to Ahaz, both that God was with him and that God would protect him. Isaiah was one of the most important books of the Hebrew Bible for Jesus, as it was for the early church. The New Testament contains more than 60 allusions or direct quotations simply from Isaiah. Many of them point to a particular way of reading. Much of what Isaiah prophesied was, as we, as we have seen, addressing specific circumstances in the future. It foretold how God was about to work at that time. But every generation of Jews that followed Isaiah's time looked at his words in the light of their own time and heard them in a picture of how God might work in their time as well. Early Christians also read Isaiah this way, seeing Isaiah's words in a time or pattern, how God has worked in their lives. So this is how Matthew would have read it. The promise of a child whose name would be Emmanuel. Now, let's stop for a second because that's a lot. You have this ancient history that we probably haven't even given two thoughts about between Israel that's now divided into two kingdoms, considered Israel or Samaria, and then Judah. And those two people who were at odds, the northern country or kingdom saying, we would like to y'all to help us, them saying no. And then all of that follows is that God says, I will take care of this. If you just stand in faith, I will take care of this. Ask me for a sign. And then Ahaz is like, no, I don't really want to ask for a sign. And so Isaiah says, well, God's going to give you one anyway. Here you go. There's going to be a baby born. Okay. And he's going to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then to prove that as time went on and as Jesus was getting older, this, these two armies, the Assyrian army came and attacked the people that Ahaz was worried about and defeated them. Every single thing that said was going to come true, came true. So now let's skip to Matthew, a story you're probably more familiar with. It talks about the birth of Jesus, where it says all this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. She, the virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, the, this child, right, um, as we've seen, it says whose birth Isaiah foretold with these words was an ordinary child who lived in the 8th century before Christ to serve as a sign of God's presence with King Ahaz. But for Matthew, this Emmanuel is a foreshadowing of Jesus. There's no evidence that Mary ever called Jesus Emmanuel. The name is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. Matthew alone found this somewhat obscure verse a powerful picture and told us what it should be. The emphasis on Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit seems to be Matthew's way of pointing to his, uh, this unique identity, right? That God would be born and be fully God and fully human. Now, we're going to talk about what that, what, what that means. And the name of this book is called Incarnation. And so I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and give it away. That's what incarnation actually means. To put it as Adam Hamilton says, it says, This is what we mean when we speak of incarnation. God took on flesh and entered our world as a human being. Now, not merely 
God disguised as a human body. And let's talk about the movies that we've seen where people have tried to portray God, right? And it gives us some examples in the book. But Evan Almighty, Bruce Almighty, there's an old one that he references that I totally forgotten about called Oh God with John Denver in it. And, and Hollywood tries to paint what God looks like or what we per perceive as God. And usually it's an older man, right? But we know that God can, can show up in any form, in any way, and that it still can be God. So God wasn't just an image, uh, you know, God wrapped up inside a body like some sort of Avenger hero. God became human. And that's significant because when God is with us in this image, God is with us in everything. Our fears, God, Jesus knew pain, Jesus knew heartache, he knew rejection. All the things that we as humans deal with, as far as emotions and all the other things are concerned, God was with us, became us, so that he could know those things as well. So this, there's a question on, on the study part that says, what movies and television shows can you think of where God is a character? That has been portrayed over and over again. And do you think it's portrayed well? Would be another good question. And then how does the fact that God lived as a human being with all the temptations and struggles that we experience affect your relationship with God? Does it make it more real? Does it make it less real? If you were here, I'd ask good questions. So I just hope that you would take that in and respond. So let me skip down. It says this, God doesn't just imagine what it's like to be human. How could an all-powerful God really know what it's like to be weak, scared, tempted, or hurt? But Jesus knew because he became human or became flesh. So let me skip ahead just a little bit. Get my notes straight. Okay. If you've ever, Adam has a great story in here and I'll, I'll summarize for you. He had someone come to him and talk about how he was questioning his faith and he just didn't know if this whole thing was real. And how do you prove that God is real or God is among us? And this is what Adam told this young man. Oops, sorry, I forgot to turn that off. That God, whose glory fills the cosmos, actually did what he says he, what he said he was going to do. He did what Moses asked. He did what everybody asked. He came to show himself. Now, there is a passage in scripture where um, Moses asked God and he says, show me all your glory. And essentially, God's like, really? Like, he, and, and the response is really cool because he's almost like, you can't handle that. Because I don't even know what that would be. Like asking God to show me his glory. Like, wow. I don't even, what could happen? I don't even know. So he says, he comes to us. It, he shows us his glory by coming to us as Jesus, right? And Jesus is the way that we see the world. You have to view it kind of through that lens. So he told this young man, I see God through the world that God has made, right? I see God most when I look at Jesus. When I picture what Jesus is like, the character of God, love, mercy, and grace, I see Jesus. I see him loving broken people, eating with sinners, tax collectors. I see him healing the sick, restoring vision to those that are blind, treating lepers and the untouchables, coming to a funeral procession and sharing the grief of a mother who's lost her son, then raising the young men back to life. I think about the Jesus who cast out demons from those who were ill, mentally ill, plagued by forces greater than themselves. I think of the compassion he used at the, when the prostitute wept at his feet. I think about the Jesus who said the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. That's what Emmanuel means. This version of seeing God through Jesus is our Emmanuel. All the things that Jesus did as a living human, breathing human being is how we can be incarnate, how we can show God's love. Matthew begins his gospel telling us that Jesus is God with us, Emmanuel, and at the end of the gospel recounts Jesus' words to the disciples, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's not just that God was with us in Jesus, but that God continues to be with us, still Emmanuel. And because he is with me, I live differently. Now, the question is, how can you live differently? If you believe that we see God through Jesus and then we have the authority, if you will, to act accordingly, and we can help show kindness, show compassion, do all the things in love and show grace and forgiveness, that's what Jesus did, then so how do you live differently? And at the end of this, in the notes, it says, um, take a minute to think about how you can reflect on how you 
can incarnate God's love. Like, how can you do that? And and it says you might give some examples. Like, I can be more kind. I can be more loving. I can be more forgive, forgiving. And he challenges us in the very end of this. Don't say, don't just say, I'll be kind. I'll be nicer to people. Be super intentional about what you're saying. I will be kind by fill in the blank. I will be, show more grace by fill in the blank. I will be more forgiving. And how I will do that is fill in the blank. Because we can't do this on our own. We are just not cool enough people to say, I'm going to be more kind and then just be more kind. Because our, our resolve will fade and we'll forget about it and we'll be kind for the day and think we've done a great thing and then we'll want to be a pat on the back for doing, oh, I was kind all day. What he's saying is live differently. Because Emmanuel came, because God is with us and still with us, we have no excuse not to live differently. I don't care how crazy 2020 has been. We have the hope that was given in a baby that was born uh, so many years ago that brought us the, the concept of living differently. And that's what Jesus did the rest of his life. He walked around as the king nobody, nobody wanted or even knew they needed, saying, man, I just love people. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. You just love people. Well, how should I do this? You should probably love people. And so the very basis of this Emmanuel with us is that we have what we need to live differently. You don't have to be superhuman. You don't have to be Moses who sees the face of God. You don't have, none of that is important if you know and have the hope of what Jesus is, who he is and what he can do. So having the power within you to live differently knowing that Emmanuel lives in you and is a part of us should change how we view Christmas. We should be so excited to be reminded that we have this Emmanuel with us all the time. It should renew our hope. It should renew our, our determination to live differently. And so I challenge me, I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do, but I challenge you this last week before it becomes Christmas week. We've talked about hope at church. We've talked about peace at church. We've talked about love. This, this week is the week of love. Next week is the week of joy. If you want to experience true joy at Christmas when it comes next week, then work on these other things. Live differently so that when Christmas comes, you have put in the work of Advent and you can celebrate all that Christmas is and all that it can be. And when 2021 rolls around, and maybe it's not magically different on January the 1st, but there's hope that it will be different in 2021, let's not forget some of the lessons that we learned, which is hanging out with people safely and distantly is better sometimes than what we think fun is. Sometimes hanging out with your family is a good idea. Sometimes being patient and just hanging on to faith and hope is what we need. There are lots of other good things that came from 2020. I'm not dissing 2020 completely, but I do know that this particular season is every year reminds me of the hope, peace, joy, and love that we have in Advent and being reminded to live differently because of a baby that came. So that's our challenge for the week. Next week, we'll do another one. And then there's a follow-up lesson after that, because as a reminder to you, the days of Christmas start on Christmas Day and they carry us through Epiphany, which happens in January. So don't get flustered when you hear Away in a Manger on the radio and you're like, Christmas is over. It's not. Christmas is just beginning. And let that momentum carry you into January of 2021. Take hope, peace, joy, and love with you because Emmanuel is with you as well. See you next time.